Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. I wanted to make a quick follow-up to a video I posted a few days ago about a field programmable analog array that my colleague Jennifer Hassler dropped off. I first started posting lectures on YouTube during COVID, and people liked these so much that I just kept doing it. One thing that's been consistent over the past five years is that I generally can't predict what videos are going to get the most attention. I've previously posted some videos where I've played around with the simulator that Professor Hassler's group created, and you see these have generally not gotten a lot of views. So I was shocked at how much attention my last video received. It became my sixth most viewed video in five days. Although my second most viewed video is a 12-second clip of a giant sandworm puppet I saw at DragonCon. Did I mention I never have any idea of what's going to be popular? Anyway, I wanted to make a follow-up video addressing some comments I received. A lot of people asked, "Why would you want to use a device like this?" There's two aspects to that question. One question has to do with the field programmable aspect. Assuming you're going for analog technology, you might choose an FPAA for all the same reasons you might choose an FPGA in the digital domain. Maybe you want to design a custom ASIC, and FPAAs offer the possibility for trying out ideas and rapid prototyping. Or just as a lot of people use FPGAs in final production products. If these FPAAs are produced at scale, so the prices can come down, you might start seeing them out in the wild, the way FPGAs are now out in the wild. And being able to reconfigure your analog hardware on the fly is inherently cool. The second aspect of the question: Why use one of these devices? The deeper question is: Why use analog signal processing at all? Why use it instead of digital signal processing? Where you have an analog to digital converter and a digital to analog converter with a digital computer sandwiched in between, running an algorithm. After all, by doing your processing in a computer program, you have a tremendous amount of flexibility. You might have many reasons for making that choice. I happen to think analog circuits are fun, but the real killer app for analog signal processing is low-power computation. In particular, if you operate MOSFETs in the subthreshold, aka weak inversion region, where you get this exponential voltage current characteristic, unlike the usual square law characteristic that you get in the above threshold, aka strong inversion region, you can create complicated systems that use a shockingly low amount of power. This way of thinking is particularly amenable to neuromorphic computation. There were some questions about bandwidth. For that, I would point you to this review paper and this chart here. This FPA architecture in the 350 nanometer process operates at a 50 megahertz bandwidth, and that's the particular chip that I have right now. While in 45 nanometers, this architecture is capable of 4 gigahertz. One thing I want to mention is there's nothing particularly special about the fabrication process for these chips. They're piggybacking off of regular Digital logic technology. Some people noted that FPAAs in some form have been around for a while. You have things like the Green Pack line from Renaissance. Infineon is now the keeper of the Cypress IP, and Okiko, which produced and lent me this FPAA board, is now the keeper of the original Anadyme IP. I'll just mention that these newer floating gate based FPAAs. Are vastly more powerful and flexible than those older devices. Now let's talk about the big one, the price. Yeah, that's a lot. But as I mentioned in my last video, this was a small production run. This is geared towards companies that want to get a leg up on using this technology. If production can scale up, prices can come down. Yeah, modern cell phones are expensive, but if you think about it. It's really amazing that this much technology is available at that price. That's only possible because Samsung produces these by the hundreds of millions. And take a look at how much the first cell phone cost in 1984. In my last video, I had this section called Resources, where I talked about all these resources I linked in the description. 
I'll link the same resources in the description below, and you should check out those resources.